out here at Van Hook Falls. We're going to do our next chapter, Lesson 6, Love and Discipline. It will be obvious by now that the mutual affection established between Lass and myself was very precious to both of us. It seemed to me at times that our intimate relationship was much more than merely a man and a dog, more than a shepherd and a sheep dog, more than, more even than efficient co-workers. We had become special friends. With her keen perception, sensitive instincts, and acute intelligence, Lass had a capacity not only to understand my commands, but even to anticipate my wishes. It was this unusual awareness that made her such a remarkable worker. Because of this harmonious cooperation between us, the livestock operation prospered and flourished. The sheep were handled efficiently and with a minimum of disturbance. My own work was made much easier and more joyous. Last herself was a totally fulfilled companion who reveled in all her responsibilities. I sometimes thought of our overall relationship as a triad, a triumph between master, friend, and flock, all of it possible because of the loving cooperation of a border collie. Reflecting on this happy association we enjoyed at Fairwinds, I have often thought that this is precisely the relationship Christ desires with us. More than anything, he wants me to be his companion, his co-worker, his friend, and helping to tend his flock. This is really the essence of that final discourse he shared with his 11 disciples before his death. It is recorded for us in great detail by John in his Gospel, chapters 14 through 17. Any person who wish, wishes to grasp the true meaning of love for God should read and meditate over such those superb insights. Love for the Master is not some sentimental emotion that sweeps over the soul in moments of such piety. Love for Christ is a deliberate setting of the will to carry out his commands at any cost. It is the delight of accomplishing our Father's highest purposes no matter how challenging. The end result of such conduct is to bring sweet satisfaction to the Good Shepherd. Because of such single-minded service, we sense his approval of our behavior. We know of a surety that we are loved and appreciated, and the ultimate end is that others benefit, others are blessed, others are cared for. Jesus himself put it this way, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatever I command you. John 15, 12 through 14. It should be pointed out emphatically that to lay down one's life for another means to put the interests and wishes of others ahead of one's own. It implies that to obey Christ and carry out his intentions is more desirable than doing my own thing. It is one thing to put this down with pen and paper, but it is the toughest lesson any of us can learn to live out in our daily duties. It simply is not natural for most of us to love God or love others in the dramatic discipline of a laid down life. We are a selfish, self-serving people we have the strange worldly idea that to be of lowly service is to be used or abused. Yet God in Christ came among us in lowly service. He came to minister to us, to give himself to us. And so because he first loved us, we in turn are to be willing and ready to love him and others. As the years went by at Fairwinds, I saw an ever-increasing clarity what Jesus meant when he spoke of his love for us and our love for him. I began to understand the true implications and demands of a laid down life. Continuously, I was giving myself to last. I gave her my strength, my attention, my affection, my loyalty, my friendship, my very life. She in turn reciprocated this outpouring by giving back to me her vitality, her vigor, her enthusiasm, her cooperation, her love, her loyalty. Together, all the benefits of this relationship were then poured out upon the flock. Our mutual energies and expertise were spent in caring for the sheep. 
It would be wonderful if this sheep dog's story could end here on this noble note, but it cannot. For to be true to the tale, there are some disappointing interludes. There were times on which Lass did break faith. There were days when she did not stay steadfast. There were many distractions that came along which threw her away from her line of duty. Love, so betrayed, demands discipline to be restored. There were grievous interludes for her, for me, and for the flock. To correct her and to mend the breach between us, there had to be discipline. This was not easy or pleasant, but it was absolutely essential. I loved Lass far too much to let her revert back to her old wretched lifestyle. I was too fond of her to allow her to waste her energies for naught. She was made for great things, intended for lofty service, so both of us would have to suffer to set her straight. Discipline is never pleasant. The correction that comes with love causes pain, both for the administrator and the recipient. Many of us prefer to push it all aside. We find it easier to simply brush bad behavior to one side, acting as if it did not matter. But true love demands discipline. If there's to be mutual trust, integrity, and loyalty again, then it must involve some suffering for us to learn this lesson. It was not easy to punish Lance. After all, she was my friend. It demanded self-discipline on my part to insist that she perform properly up to her full potential. To correct her conduct with stern words or a severe reprimand or even a sharp slap made her draw back with reproach. Her bright eyes were filled, would fill with foreboding. She would lay back her ears with remorse. She would crouch low, her tail drawn down between, down between her legs in a hangdog posture. For a few moments, there was a distinct coolness between us. She knew full well she had failed, and she knew I was far from satisfied with her performance. I never allowed these interludes of discipline to last long. Correction came swiftly, it came surely, yet it was over in short order. Then I would call her to me quietly. I would speak to her softly in reassuring tones. Last, it's all over. I would hold her close, rub her chest, run my hands over her head. We're friends. All is well. Her eyes would begin to sparkle again as she looked up into my face. Sometimes she would reach out to lick my cheek with her tongue. Her body would quiver and she would begin to move her tail with pleasure. The strict discipline had brought total restoration of trust between us. We were fond and loyal friends again. The highest good had been served the best interests of all of us have been preserved. For me, the entire area of God's discipline of my personal life was best learned from last. Through such examples, I came to understand implicitly what my master's intentions are for me during those times when, my, when he corrects my conduct. As the Spirit of God makes abundantly clear in Hebrews 12, 6 through 11, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth or disciplines. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness, righteousness unto which, unto them which are exercised thereby. For years there has been prominent in the church an unbalanced overemphasis upon the love of God. There has been a universal tendency to teach that Christ is so compassionate, so kind, that he does not discipline us for wrongdoing. There is the false impression that any old thing can go on, that God will simply forgive and forget all about it. It simply is not so. There is a price to pay for our perverseness. There is a discipline we deserve for wrongdoing. There is the master's demand that we be faithful in service, serious in our responsibilities to him and others. We distort, distort the true character of Christ if we assert that he will merely wink at wrong. He is grieved when we deliberately disobey his commands and selfishly ignore his wishes. When Peter betrayed his master the night before the crucifixion, it took one searching look to shatter the man's soul. 
He went out into the darkness to break down in tears and remorse. In burning shame, he was reduced from a tough, cursing fellow to a soul-shattered penitent. Yet this is, was the man so swiftly restored after the Master's resurrection. He was a servant spoken to with such reassurance besides delight. Peter, do you love me? Then feed my feet. Three times over in a triad of tenderness, the bonds of trust, love, and loyalty were reestablished between Jesus and his friend. Like last, we shrink back from the discipline of God. We find it grievous. We would rather it was set aside. It cannot be. It is for our best. It is for his benefit. It is for the eventual blessing of others whose lives we touch. And when it is all over, the bonds of affection between Christ and others are even stronger than before. We instinctively, deep within our own spirits, we know we deserve discipline. We know the Master would not be to himself or to us if we simply let, us mis let our misconduct slide into sinister selfishness. He disciplines because he cares, because he loves, because he heals. With this reassurance comes renewed joy. There is total restoration. There is pure delight and once again doing his bidding. Love y'all.